Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this special workshop uh, with Victoria and West Shore Child and Youth Mental Health Clinicians. Um, my name is Beatrice Toner. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Saanich Neighborhood Place. We're a nonprofit organization that's been serving families and children in Saanich and Greater Victoria for over 25 years. Some of you know us maybe through our drop-in programs or community kitchens or other parenting programs. We're very lucky to be joined today by um, three wonderful ladies from uh, Child and Youth Mental Health Services. We have uh, Dr. Jackie Bush, hi Jackie, um, Dr. Mari Perrin and Heather Vale too. Hi both of you. Um, so just a few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there's a Q&A function on Zoom. We invite you to use that as questions come up during the session. Um, we will be addressing the questions at the end of the session, but as you're, you know, we're discussing things and things pop up, feel free to type them in there. We'll get to them at the end. Um, I want to thank uh, United Way of Greater Victoria and Children's Health Foundation. Their funding makes this kind of uh, workshop available and, and possible. And uh, before we do get started on the talk of the power of play, special playtime during the pandemic and beyond, I want to get a quick poll of who's in the room and what your families might look like. So I'm going to launch the poll. And it's just like an idea about the ages of your family and the size of your family. So take a minute there to uh, answer if you can. That'll give us an idea about who's in the room. All right. I love seeing the votes come in. It's like it's live election day or something. <laughs> um, so I'm, thank you for everybody to for everybody who's answering. Um, so it looks like uh, folks with kids. Yeah, actually quite a range this time around. I'll uh, display it all when I've got all the answers in so we can all see. But a big focus on sort of the ages three, well actually, all the way through, kind of distributed above three, age three, just distributed all the way through. I'll give it another few seconds for folks to put in their children's ages and how many kids they have. Awesome. Okay. So there are the results for you to see. So lots of families with one child, two, three, four, five more, and then uh, kids, a lot of families with kids about the age of 11. That's awesome. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna close that. Oh. And so here we go, the power of play. I'll let you folks take it over. Thanks, B. So I'm really excited to be able to do this presentation with my um, fellow CYMH clinicians. Um, we see a lot of children and families at Child and Youth Mental Health that struggle with a variety of different emotions or behaviors or just, you know, trying to adapt to a challenge, challenging situation. What we find is, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes work with is actually play and specifically teaching caregivers and parents to do special play time to really help, um, help their children cope with challenging situations and behaviors. So really empowering the parent to be that, that person that can, can help them, guide them through difficult, challenging times through the special play time. So really excited that we get this chance to speak with you guys about that and give you a little bit of a taste of what that might look like. Thanks, B. So COVID-19, it's been a funny thing in the sense or unusual thing that it's impacted so many families or every family really in some way or another. So suddenly we all had this unique stress put on top of us. And um, that's what we thought might be really helpful for a wider audience to talk about, like how do we help our kids when there are weird disruptions like this that are bound to cause some stress or some adjustment at least. Um, and that's partly why we're doing this presentation as well too. So if we think about from the kids perspective, uh, so many things were turned upside down, you know, in a matter of weeks. Um, from school closures to lots of preschools and daycare closing and 
And again, like kids spend so much time in those settings. Um, it's, you can almost think about those settings being like their second family in some ways. And suddenly that was gone or changed at least. Uh, same with peer relationships, especially for the kids, you know, age four or five up, those become very important. And then particularly in the middle childhood, of course, as well too, and teens. And that had to change um, so fast too with how they were able to interact or not. Extracurricular activities, which are such a common thing for kids to engage in, suddenly weren't happening. Playgrounds were closed. Extended family members, which again, for lots of families, are a really important part of their family were suddenly limited and then in the context of you know our own adults and parents work schedules being turned also upside down and the stress level of the whole family being up with it too so even though some of these things are now you know fortunately expanding again in terms of peers and expanding our social bubbles we can nonetheless expect for the next little while that there's going to be ongoing adjustment and change that's going to be happening and we know even though change can elicit positive development at the end, um, oftentimes there's that, that sense of unsettlement while we're not really sure where we're navigating to. So just having that kind of lens for kids too, things that were very much taken for granted were suddenly changed or just suddenly gone. And so with that, um, we'd expect some adjustment uh, changes or difficulties for some kids in this presentation we'll talk a little bit more about how you can help offer that for children as well. Thanks Pete. <clears throat> so I just want to spend just a minute on talking a little bit about how kids cope in different ways that kids cope and just like adults we have a variety of ways that we cope. Some are more helpful, some are less helpful and for kids um, these are some of the, you know, every kid's a little different, of course, but these are some of the common things that we see. When kids are stressed, we can really expect some behavioral and emotional changes, at least in the short term. You can think about that even, you know, your child might be had a really long day at summer camp. Um, maybe their best friend wasn't there and then something, maybe they fell and bumped their knee or got stung by a bee and you pick them up. And their frustration tolerance is just not the same as usual. So little things might upset them much more. There might be more prying. They just don't bounce back as fast. So when our kids are stressed in general, we oftentimes see a lower frustration tolerance, just like with adults as well too. Uh, we can see some more hyperactivity for some kids that are much more restless, feeling in their body. That can be a stress response. A common one can be increased clinginess, whining. So needing so much attention from you, um, feels like you can't fill up their bucket. Uh, so that is sometimes also stress response that we can see in kids. Very common are the problems with sleep and tummy aches and headaches. Um, kids oftentimes express their stress through more body symptoms. So their body kind of talks for them when they can't really put into words what's going on for them, what's hard for them. And then when we talk about regressive behaviors, we really think about, let's say you have a six-year-old and suddenly they remind you of, oh, this is just how they were when they were three. So behaviors that remind you of when the child was younger, that's what we think about when we talk about regressive behaviors. And those oftentimes come out to when um, our kids are stressed. So just kind of be out to look out for those. Um, and just how we talked about the previous two presentations, kind of be curious when, when your child's being particularly difficult about what may be else be going on. It might not just be difficult behavior per se. The good news though is, is that we know that a supportive caregiving relationship is really the key to help kids buffer stress and to move through stress in a healthful manner. And that's why we put so much focus also on parents when we see kids um, with challenges. A lot of our work is actually with parents because we know if we empower them to help the kids, we get much further because you play such an important role. This next slide is just to show in general, you can think about, you know, think about yourself as well too, or maybe your partner, other important people in your life. You can think almost there's this tank that we have and when our tanks are filled and how we fill those can be, you know, through, let's say, good sleep and good nutrition. And let's say you have a good routine, you're looking forward to something, you're well rested. 
that's usually when we see everybody at their best self, including our kids. Um, at the same time, when our tanks are running empty, maybe we're starting to get sick, we got a bad night's sleep, maybe this mosquito in our bedroom wasn't letting us sleep well, you know, there's nothing for breakfast properly, uh, maybe we just had a fight with somebody, then our tanks are getting lower, same with our kids. And this is when we'll see the more acting out kind of behaviors and what we think of actually connecting seeking behaviors. So the whining, the clinginess, I can't get dressed by myself. Can you give me another toast? Like all those, like where you know your child is theoretically ind independent can do these tasks most of the times. Then if you see more of those kinds of behaviors, you might know oh, the tank might be running low. The tricky thing with that is as soon as our kids act out more, what happens is for most, you know, we correct our children more. And this is not just parents, but every adult or, or siblings even. So then I was like, you know, stop whining or you can do that for yourself or stop this. This is common words in our repertoire for all of us. So children will hear lots of corrections, uh, negativity towards themselves, their behaviors, even if we frame in behavior terms, it doesn't matter too much. So, but what will happen is the tank will continue to go further down empty. And then you're in that cycle of more acting out behaviors, more corrections. I don't feel worse. And before we know it, we're in that cycle where it's hard to sidestep if we don't do something kind of mindfully about it where we're in. Thanks, B. All right. So um, as Mari mentioned, um, parenting during COVID-19 looks really different. And as we've mentioned in other presentations, our children are with us for more hours in the day than normal. And while this can bring new stresses, it also brings new opportunities. So today what we wanted to cover was to help you understand the importance of play, to learn about special playtime, and to help you set yourself up for success. So we'll move on to the next. So the importance of play is the first one. And one of the things we really want to stress is that children process their experiences through play rather than talking about what's bugging them. So it supports them to make sense of their world. Um, it helps them express themselves. Kids don't do it through words to the same extent that we do. They don't have the same unlimited vocabulary. So they have the opportunity to express things through play. Um, to process their experiences and stressors. These are things, again, where they need to be able to play it out and act it out so that they can understand it and make sense of it. And then to learn about their world. So this is also where they try things and have things fall apart and then they put it back together and they try to figure out how things go. And then the last is developing new physical and mental skills. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know that's around things like allowing them to be challenged and try and figure something out and not fix it for them, but be there in a way that supports them enough that they can move through it. So we'll, we'll come back to that later. So the big takeaway for that one is play is the language of children. Thanks, B. So one of the things we wanna to talk to you about is the power of the parent as the play partner. This is so important. And again, Mariah mentioned this earlier and you're with your kids more than anybody else, even in non-COVID times. And so they can come and spend time with us and do play therapy with us for maybe one hour a week at best, and then they go home to you. And so we really think it's important to share these skills and this knowledge with you so that you have the opportunity to understand your child better and support them in ways that are really helpful to them in doing all of those things that we talked about on the last slide. So you're the most important presence in your child's world. You're there the most, you matter the most to them. You have an established relationship and you can't beat that. Um, we talk about it as you being your child's most important toy and there's some truth to that. There's, you know, you're, you're another thing in their life that another being in their life that allows them to experience all of those things on the previous slide, to learn and grow and develop. And if we can do it in a playful way, it works really well for kids. And then the other thing about this is that all of the things we're talking about today is supported by research. So it's consistently shown really big benefits of parents being taught and mentored 
on how to conduct therapeutic play sessions with their child on a regular basis. And regular basis really is the key, and we'll get into that more as we go on. Thanks, B. Okay, so now we're going to move into talking more about special playtime, what that looks like. As we watch videos and talk about it more specifically, you'll start to maybe notice that special playtime is a bit different than how we might typically play with kids. So it's got some specific structure and format to it. So we'll just watch this video as a first introduction to it.
Thanks, B. So one of the reasons we promote special playtime so much is because there are many benefits to it. Um, and we're going to move into how to do it in a minute. But we just wanted to highlight some of the, the benefits that can come from special playtime. So as, as Heather mentioned, play is the language of children. So having special time for them to play with you allows them to communicate thoughts, their needs, their feelings in an environment that feels safe for them um, and fun because they're going to be doing it through the use of play. It helps them feel understood by their characters. So that's a really powerful thing for kids to experience, this idea of being accepted and understood by their loved one. And we'll talk more about how that gets communicated to the child through reflecting what they're doing, what they're feeling. Um, we saw a little bit of that in the video we just watched. But that idea that kids get this feeling of my parents understand me or my caregiver accepts me to how I am is an incredibly powerful thing for children's healthy development and well-being. They get to experience positive feelings. So feelings like um, increased sense of confidence, being able to do something, uh, their self-worth. Uh, they get to experience a sense of respect and confidence. So lots of positive experiences and feelings can come from these special play times that they have. They get these opportunities to help increase their self troll So through the supportive special playtime experience, they can experience um, frustration and learn to cope with frustration, for example, how to tolerate that, how to work within limits. They also experience the chance, as you'll Noted in the video, everything was somewhat child directed. The child was leading the play, and that part of this. So, in the special play time, as a caregiver, you're always redirecting the responsibility back to the child, so they get to decide what they play with in the session, how that goes. So, they learn to develop responsibility, responsibility for their choices, for their actions. They get their needs met in appropriate ways. And one of the key pieces is it strengthens the parent-child relationship, creates warm, fun memories that they draw on. And as we mentioned earlier, the parent-child or caregiver-child relationship is so key to children's well-being, their mental health, their ability to cope with difficult, stressful times. Uh, as time, just the special playtime together, helps foster that relationship even more and develop a sense of trust and security in their relationship with the caregiver as well. There's a myriad of benefits to the special playtime um, in addition to just the child gets a chance to play. A lot happening in these sessions you'll have. Thanks, B. Thank you. Yeah, so we just want to spend a little bit of time about how to do these kinds of play sessions at home. And um, we'll be covering these, the following domains to help set yourself up for success, which includes you know, choosing the time to do them, uh, selecting the place where, where is maybe one of the better places to do them, where maybe to avoid, uh, how to practice what we call be with attitude, which we'll talk about in a little bit how to use the be with attitudes in the session, um, toys and selection of supplies as well too, and when and how do we set limits in play sessions as well. So we, let's go on to choosing the time. <clears throat> so choosing the time, ideally um, we're looking at once per week for about 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And what's really important is that, you know, you pick a time where you're kind of, you're feeling good. You're, you're feeling kind of that you can be emotionally available to your child. There's not a million different demands on you right those 30 minutes. Um, so you can really focus on your child during those 20 to 30 minutes. 
And then also important is that it's at a time where your child is feeling okay. Um, you know, that they're not overly tired or hungry or that they're just about to, you know, run out with, to do a play date with their best friend. You don't want to have to compete with something like that or, or that they usually watch, you know, their favorite show at that time. Uh, you don't want to have to compete with those kind of really fun things that kids get to do too. Um, but yeah, so ideally once per week, 20 to 30 minutes. A bonus is if, if in your routine you can build it in that always happens at the same time. Again, thinking about predictability, routine still being so important for your child. And if you're able to do that, what you'll find is that most kids really look forward to that time. And um, it becomes just even more special than it already is if it can be consistently done at a, you know, always Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock or something like that, that the kid can count on. That, that's ideal. And in terms of selecting the place, um, here you might have to get a little bit creative and kind of think about it ahead of time. What we're hoping for is that you can find a, you can find a space where uh, you can isolate yourself a little bit from the others and your family members. So meaning that's just you and your child for those 20 to 30 minutes. So that includes, you know, thinking through, hmm, you know, who can take maybe the baby or the brother that you're not doing special playtime with or where can the pets be that they don't come in and interrupt us. So trying to be a bit creative about finding a time when other people can take care of your, your other competing demands maybe at that time. So it's just you and your child. We know that that's the most powerful. So free of distractions, um, you know, turning your phone off. Some people kind of say do a do not disturb sign. So everybody knows this is you and I and, and nothing will disturb me or uh, this is so important to me and you're so important to me that um, just you and I get to focus on here too. The other trick is Thinking about um, doing it a place where you might you don't have to be worried what if it gets a little bit more messy. And so some families have done amazingly, like in the kitchen even, where if there's a little bit spilled water, it's not a big deal. Um, some people have used the garage. If it's nice outside, you can think about you know, using your backyard to select a kind of area for that. So being a bit creative, we just don't want to be in a place where you know, if let's say they throw a ball and, and there's really expensive things that they might hit, we, do, we want to create a situation where we actually don't have to set too many limits. So that kind of goes in hand with finding a space where, um, yeah, where you don't have to worry so much about other things getting uh, dirty or broken. Thanks, B. All right, B with attitudes um, or attitude. What I want you to do is kind of take a moment and think about someone you've met who made you feel like the most special, important person in the world. And then consider what they did that made you feel so good. That's really what we're talking about here, is just that kind of presence. So it's really in your intention too. And your actions, your presence, your responses is what's most important and what gets conveyed to your child. So giving your child your full attention being right with them, facing your body towards them, listening with your eyes and your ears. So, you know, if I was talking to you like this, it probably wouldn't be very effective. But if I face you and I talk with you, that's what we want you to do with your kids. See your child's play through their eyes. And what we mean by that is get curious. Really spend some time and, and start to wonder about what it is that's happening in their internal world, their emotions, their thoughts, all of those things. Next slide, B. Um, and I think it was Mariah or Jackie who said something about this earlier, allowing your child to lead. That came from the first special playtime video. This is really important. This isn't a time to teach or ask questions or provide your opinion. So if they pick up a dinosaur and they call it a sheep, go with the sheep. That's really important because it's about seeing it through your children's eyes. And it might not make any sense, but once you start to do it, it becomes kind of apparent why it's working. It allows them to really express themselves in ways that are important. Um, and the other thing that if you teach instead of leading or allowing your child to lead, if you teach, it puts you in charge of the play and it doesn't allow them to do what it is they need to do in their playtime. 
but we do encourage you to join actively and playfully as a follower. So if your child invites you in and says, you be the doctor, then you be the doctor. You get to follow their lead. And you can ask them, if you're not sure how to do that, you could say, how do I be the doctor? And kind of do a stage whisper. That's what we call it anyway. And check it out with them and, and see what they'd like you to do. And that goes for games too. If you have a deck of cards and you're playing a game, if they cheat, it's not cheating. It's just how they play the game. So you just go along with whatever rules they make up during games too. So verbally describe what you see to let the child know you're interested and involved in their play. An example of that would be a sports broadcaster. If any of you watch soccer, you know they get down to the detail and if you listen to it on the radio, you can see the game. That's really what we're talking about here. So in this, this picture, it could be, uh, you're looking at your shoes. Um, and just giving them an example of that. So when you follow their lead, you might say something like, during our special playtime, that's something you can decide when you're letting them decide what it is you do. Show me what you want to do. That's up to you. That can be whatever you want it to be. And examples of the sportscaster would be, you're giving a baby a bottle. You're using lots of colors in that drawing, or you're drawing a circle. So instead of saying something like, oh, you're making a sun, you're drawing a circle. And you crash that right into that if they took a car and crashed into blocks. That's the kind of thing we're talking about with this. Next. So to continue this, it's about reflecting your child's thoughts and feelings with words and actions. And what we mean by that is um, saying something like, oh, you think that's silly. That surprised you. You really like to draw. You don't know how that turned out. You wish there were different toys to play with because sometimes the kids will sit down and they won't know what to do and that that's okay. It's just about expressing what it is you see in front of you and encourage your children's ability and efforts. So it's not based on whether your child did something correctly. It might be you're working hard to put that together. And you've probably heard this from the school if you have school-aged children. Um, you have another idea about that. You figured that out. You kept trying until you got it and really encouraging them. And then the last is giving your child a five minute and a one minute notice when you're nearing the end of the playtime. And that's really important so that they know and they have time to kind of wrap up what it is that they're doing. Next. Oh, over to you. Jackie, you're muted. Sorry about that. I muted myself <laughs> to make sure I wasn't being noisy during other people's talks. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about toys um, because the toys you, you choose to, for special playtime are we want you to draw from certain categories. So because um, what we're looking for are toys that help facilitate your children's expression of their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences, their imagination that allow them to work on mastering certain skills. Um, and so we're looking for specific toys. So we're not looking for things like that are electronics, video games, or board games, things like that, that are very structured. So um, one way to think of it is these different categories of toys. So the first category, and before I get into this, I just want to mention that we're not asking you to go out and buy a bunch of toys or anything like that. These can be toys you have around that have been used before. Um, you could even make certain things if you wanted to, but we're just giving you a taste of the types of toys that you use and whatever you have around um, will be great. So please don't feel pressure to go out and buy things. So the first category is family nurturing types of toys. So these are things like um, doll families or doll houses or even toy animal families if you don't have dolls. Um, a kitchen set, babies, uh, even ba old baby bottles things like that, that that encourage sort of expressions of nurturance or family relationships. 
Another category is communication toys. So these are things like um, telephones or walkie talkies. Uh, if you have old cell phones you don't use anymore, those can be really handy. Um, kids like to pretend it's on their cell phones. Uh, so something that that is indicative of communication of some kind. The third category is aggression toys. Um, and these are things like maybe small dinosaurs or um, typically aggressive animals like sharks or things like that. Um, could be soldiers like toy plastic stirrers, uh, plastic guns. You want to make sure they're not realistic looking guns. Could be like a pretend colorful Nerf gun or something like that. Uh, maybe aggressive puppets like an aggressive puppet with dinosaur teeth or not dinosaur teeth, sharp teeth or something like that, kind of aggressive looking. Um, it could be uh, toy rubber knives or a rope. You could take a jump rope and cut things off, things like that. Um, just a word about aggression toys. Sometimes or often caregivers are a little bit hesitant to include these kinds of toys in play or are a little bit um, uncomfortable at first with aggressive play that can emerge in the special playtime sessions. But we really encourage you to, to have these, some sort of items like these available to your, your kids because they, they're a really important component of what your kids might need to express. So addressing anger and being able to express these things um, that can be incredibly intense in the safe play environment. Um, can be very healthy so they learn to express it and then they move on to something else as well. So I've had, I've worked with lots and lots of kids who are not aggressive, necessarily violent in the community at all, but they, some of the times they'll come in and can be pretty intense and, and need to use some of those toys, get those feelings out because they don't have those words uh, as we talked about earlier. So being able to have those materials available so they can express those feelings and learn that it's okay to have those feelings and that all those feelings are accepted is really important. And it can be also important because it'd be an opportunity for limit setting and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So if you have a toy gun and your child is aiming it at you and you don't want it aimed at you, then that's an opportunity to do the limit setting and for them to learn boundaries and self-control and those kinds of things that we're, we're helping to foster in kids. Uh, so it can be a bit uncomfortable at first to see aggressive play, um, but we encourage you to stick with it. Um, and just as Heather was saying, it's not an opportunity to teach them or direct them. It's just, it's reflecting what they're expressing. Um, you know, two animals are fighting, you can reflect on that. Uh, and not, not worry about turning it into a teachable moment. Worry that it's a sign of something problematic in your kids, because um, all kids express these kinds of emotions and, and it can be easy for them to learn to do so. So that's my little pitch of the aggression toys. Um, mastery toys is another category. So these are things like blocks that they can work on building or Lego where they can be challenged and need to problem solve. Um, water toys, pots and pans, plastic food, cups, things like that. And the final category is creative expression toys. So these can be uh, all kinds of different things like dress up clothes. If you have old clothes that you could use for dress up play, um, play money, um, you could even make play money, uh, markers, paper, Play-Doh, uh, a magic wand, uh, uh, cars, trucks, a medical kit, small plastic animals. Sometimes you can even make like a little mini sand tray if you, if you have those materials available. Um, so that gives you a sense of some of the toys, the different category toys that you can use. And again, you don't have to go out and buy them. You can just use whatever you have on hand um, for your special playtime.
Great, so we're just gonna watch uh, another about five minute video of a mom, um, who I believe is also a therapist though, so she has the skills down, Pat. Um, just five minutes of interaction, what this looks like, because just so you get a flavor of it. And um, yeah, let's go cool. take a look at it. Yeah. 
because you got things like moving around the paper is important. And you, your lines get smaller and smaller. Oh, those lines are really small. And then some bigger ones. So those are lots of lines. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take my teal color crayon mm -hmm. and push it up. And push it up. And I'm going to draw lines like this. Yeah. Seems like you really love to draw and draw different kinds of things. Yep. Yeah. And every time you draw, it's something different. So I never draw these things. <gasps> this is your first time to draw this? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. You seem really proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I do have something. Okay, so you have to show that. you. Oh, so you've got After right here. Okay. I color this. Alright. After I do this. That's the cool thing about drawing is you can make it into anything you want to draw. A job. A job. Job. Oh, you got this thing. Okay, great. And maybe just a few things I'll say to that video is um, hopefully we'll just give you a taste that this play is looks really different than usual play that we do with our kids. You know, some things that stood out for me there is that, um, you know, the kid was really in charge and the, and the parent didn't jump in with problem solving. You know, there was that problem at the beginning. She couldn't write her name. She wanted to write her name. And I guess if they had a conversation before that you can't say your name because of confidentiality reasons, perhaps. And the mom could have suggested something else, but instead she's like, hmm, I don't know. You know, I guess you'll have to find something else. And that was just, just a tiny example of how the kid kind of had to figure out this problem and came out with a fantastic solution of, I can use my initials. And so just, you know, showing that when we jump in for our kids too fast, we kind of rob them of that opportunity to solve some things for themselves as well, too. Other things that just stood out for me, you know, she did a lot of tracking, she did a lot of reflecting, you know, the parent might have had other ideas of there's lots of fun things that were there, um, but the kid decided to stick with what we call more mastery, like writing and drawing, um, instead of, you know, instead of the parents who did, hey, why don't we play with that, we'll just follow what the kid does, and we oftentimes, children tend to be sometimes quite repetitive in their play. There's a good developmental function for that. It's really important for them to be repetitive, but boy, can it be boring for us adults to stick that out. And here, you know, just sort of remind yourself it's for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, and we're just gonna totally follow your lead. And if they want to write their name or draw over and over, despite all these other fun activities, it's okay. And what it just it just gives that child the space to do stuff that usually you know we, we're just a little bit too busy to have that kind of patience typically you stick with kids and and their activity for such a long time with it too so um yeah so we hear oftentimes I play with my child all the time like you know how is this helpful and and but this is a different very different kind of play and um and kids most love it you know it's it's not very often that a child has that focused adult attention particularly parent attention on them is a super powerful for them and very therapeutic when done in this kind of way it doesn't have to be all and just to you know note, this is not something that we would expect you to do all the time when you play with your children not at all it's um much more beneficial if that focus kind of time where you're saying now i'm going to put this as special play time and let the child lead. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about the special playtime limits. And basically, we keep them to a minimum. And the reason we do that, um, well, we, we do a lot of the setup as we talked about choosing the place, setting it up in a way that you won't need a lot of limits. And it's also allowing them then to lead and you can learn a lot more about what's happening in your child's world. They're stated only when needed and said in a very calm, matter-of-fact voice. So just like you would anything else, it might be, guns are not for shooting at me. And just saying it as you would anything else to them. It's not in a raised voice, but a calm, matter-of-fact voice. 
and then they're required only to keep you, your child, or property safe during play. And this is really important um, so that they can express things and they can show you what's going on in their internal world. So we're going to talk a little bit more in the next slide about uh, the type of limit setting that we did the last time, um, ACT. So I'm going to pass that over to Jackie. And we use this in special playtime as well. Another. So, yes, so a review of ACT limit studies, we, as Heather said, we talked about a little bit yet yeah, uh, last time. Uh, this is the approach uh, that we, we think is beneficial to take. And it's a three prong approach, ACT. So, um, just as an example, pretend a child wants to draw on the wall or color on the wall, uh, and you don't want to have that happen because it's destroying property. So that's not good. So the first step is to acknowledge the underlying feeling. Like it would be so much fun for you to color on the wall. Um, this is an important step because it, the child learns that it's okay to have those feelings or urges or desires, that that's okay. All feelings are acceptable. Not all behavior is acceptable, but all, all feelings are acceptable. And you're conveying that, that you understand what you want to do, that it would be fun. Um, that can be pretty powerful, and often that can help de-escalate the situation. The next step is to communicate the limit. And we use very specific phrasing for this. So, but the wall is not for coming on. And one of the benefits of using this kind of phrasing is that it's just very objective and neutral. Like the wall not for coloring on um, versus you shouldn't color on the wall or it's bad to color on the wall, which can have the effect of creating shame, defensiveness in the child. But if it's a neutral fact that you're stating in your matter of fact way, like Heather said, it's the wall is not for coloring on. That just sort of removes any sting or shame out of it. And then the final step is to target an alternative. So you're providing the child a, another option for expressing uh, himself or herself. So uh, you can color on the paper or on the egg carton. And sometimes pointing at the object that you're redirecting to can also be beneficial. Um, and so through using this ACT limit setting, it would be so much fun to color on the wall. The walls are not for coloring on. You can color on the paper or on the egg carton. By using this approach, children learn to um, make their own choices and then have the consequences for those choices. So you're giving them responsibility and choice in the matter. Um, and Mariah's gonna talk a little more about when that breaks down a bit. But the idea is that, they're, that you're still returning responsibility to them, which can be very helpful building up their, their self-control and their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Great. So I just thought it might be helpful to uh, work through an example where maybe it's not going as, as we hope for <laughs> with just step one. Uh, so let's say, you know, you're doing special playtime with your child, Susan, and she built this beautiful, beautiful big tower full of blocks, worked really hard on it, and it collapsed. And she's mad, and she's upset, and she's frustrated. Maybe this is not even the first time that the tower has collapsed on her. And she's taking the blocks, and you can see what's going to happen. She's starting to check them on, on you with it, too. So you can think, well, you know, the three rules around when do we set limits is we don't want you to get hurt, we don't want the child to get hurt, and we don't want the property to get hurt or the toys. So this would fall into I don't want those blocks checked at me because that might hurt me. So it's totally acceptable to set a limit within that within special playtime. So then you would complete act that Jackie just talked about. So in this case, it might sound something like this. Susan, you are so mad. And you can mirror that with your face too. Like you are so mad, you worked so hard and you're so mad and you wanna just throw those blocks at me because right? you're so mad. So that's the A part, the acknowledge the feeling. And then the C part, the communicate the limit is, but I'm not for being thrown at, right? Mommy's not for being thrown at. So that be the C, and then the T will be target alternative. So what else can she do instead to show that she's mad? So in this case, um, you know the blocks are not going to hurt the floor. Let's say, you know if it's 
if it's the kitchen floor or so, it's carpet. So an acceptable target might be, um, but you know, you can throw the blocks on the ground or you can stomp your feet and you can even imitate the stomping for her feet too. Kind of what Jackie said, it helps to point to visually show what her alternatives are as well. Um, so let's say she continues to, you know, ch check at you, you repeat it like that too. I know you're so mad and you want to throw those blocks at me. I'm not for being thrown at. So that's where that matter of fact kind of voice comes back in. And again, show her, you know, you can throw the blocks on the ground you can stomp your feet. Why we want to do this two times is because when kids are activated and us to take some time to process sort of our choices and what mom just said and whatnot. So we always want to give the child the benefit of the doubt before doing anything else. So we always say two times we're repeated even if the behavior that you're not wanting to see that you're saying limit is happening, you still want to say it one more time. So let's say that you can change the slide. Okay, Susan's just having a bad day. She's not taking it and she's continuing to throw at you. You've gotten the two ACT completions. Then you go into what we call offer choices or warning. So there it would be, Susan, if you choose to throw blocks at me, you're choosing not to play with the blocks for the rest of the time today. If you choose not to throw blocks at me, you're choosing to continue to play with a box during special playtime. Play so we're giving them a warning about, oops, this is what's going to happen next if that behavior is not, if, if the behavior is not changing. Um, you already gave her the options before how to change it, so hopefully she'll still kind of remember I can do this or that or something else. But now you're giving a fair warning of what's going to happen next. Uh, He's had, she's having a really bad day, you know, she's, she's just so mad still and is unable to change her behavior. Um, maybe she's too activated or whatnot. It happens, right? Like kids will test limits. Um, and so she continues to throw them at you. So that's then when you would go into actually supporting the choice that you had set out before or, um, or following through with the consequence in a sense, but you still want to give her, tell her kind of what's going on, right? Not just kind of take them away. So you still want to say to her, oops, you're, you're throwing blocks at me. You've chosen not to use blocks during special playtime today. And then you collect the blocks from her. Maybe a lot of tantruming at that time would be expected, um, but you was just as, as neutrally as you can, just like, whoops, you know, the sky is blue, whoops, you threw those blocks and I take them away. So trying to take away the emotion that we're probably feeling inside for just being thrown at is really important to help de-escalate the situation with it too. And we want you to kind of try this in special playtime because this is a safe time if they, if they break a limit. So, um, and it will happen from time to time to try to use a sequence. And I would even recommend maybe practicing on your partner or on your friend, just to kind of get that ACT language down because it can, it takes a little bit of practice to get it down, but it can be very effective. Thanks, Mariah. So I, I realized that we didn't talk about things, but you probably picked up on it, that we're talking about doing special playtime one-on-one -on -one with your child. It isn't something that you do with your whole family of children. So you pick your child and you would do that time with them. And the other thing we didn't touch on was the age range. And I think we might have in our blurb, but we would do this type of special playtime with a child three, maybe two, depending to about age nine, 10. But the be with attitudes and the choices and ACT can be used with kids that are older than that. You just have to adapt it so that it's developmentally appropriate. So I just want to kind of touch on that now because I think we forgot to. And we have one more video to show you. And if you have time, I think it's really worthwhile staying and watching it with us. It's Gary Landreth who actually developed something called child, child parent relationship therapy. And he's actually in the session with a child that this is the first time they've met. But the reason we think this would be particularly helpful is that she actually brings up some things around medical stuff. And given that we're in COVID and things like that, some of the th these things may come up in your child's play. And that's the other thing we want to mention about your toy selection is making sure you have a first aid kit and a well-stocked first aid kit that would include at least band-aids, a mask because we're in COVID, um, 
you know, it might be a play syringe if your child is exposed to certain things, you know, where they may have that. And even if they're not, syringes are kind of useful. Um, those types of things. And then restocking. So if they use up all the Band-Aids one session, put more Band-Aids in. Gloves, another thing that, again, is COVID kind of appropriate, but we would throw in anyway. So let's play this video. Watch the Be With Attitudes. I think this is a really great opportunity to see how he is with her and also how he allows her to lead. It's about a six minute video, so it's gonna, we're gonna run a little bit over today, but I think it's worthwhile to share with you. So, enjoy. You're just gonna put that right up. Oh, you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to get ready. You have to get ready now. We have five more minutes in the playroom, and then it will be time to go down to the waiting room where your mom is. Okay. And you're going to take my blood with that? Oh. So you know how to use this. Because I got one at home. Oh, you have one at home, so you know how to use it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got that. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. And that goes, uh huh, like that. Mm -hmm. Oh. And you're going to put that right there and check on me. Mm. And you're making that go around. You just checked me. Yeah, maybe you need to check me now. Oh, so you think maybe you need to be checked too? Yeah, put this mask on. So I need to put the mask on. And put this over your neck. And I put this over your neck. You show me how you want me to put it. You want me to. So you're going to put that on me like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm mask. And you're going to put the mask on me. Like. There, you put the mask on me now. Now I have the mask on. Okay. Take that off. And I have this on my neck. Okay, I put this on. And we're going to put this on you right here. And, and put that on here. And put that on your ears. And I put. Okay, now I, I put. So now I put this right there. There okay. it is. Now I got that. And then I put this right there. Right there. And, and then I, squeeze that. And then I squeeze this. I can hear it going around. Makes a noise. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to doctor you, but I'm not going to do your blood pressure. Now you're going to doctor me, but not do my blood pressure. Nope. Let's need this There's one. that. Okay. Thanks. Mm. So you need this. Can't talk when you have that on. Oh, not supposed to talk. Why do you have pain on that? Hmm. There is some pain on that. Why is it? I don't know how the pain got on there. Just got on there. And you notice there's pain on there. Some people wear it like that. Some people wear it like that, you think? Mm hmm. So why does this one like that? Looks like it can go any way you want it to go. Uh -huh. So it can be like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So now you've got it on. I'm all ready to fix. And you're all ready to fix something. Okay. Now that's in your ears. Whoops, kind of hard to hold on to that. And your 
checking me? I can feel you checking me right there. Uh -uh. You're holding it very still. It was beeping. It was beeping. Mm. So? So you're just through with that. And Kate, our time is up for today in the playroom. It's time to go down to the wedding room where your mom is. Can I try that real quick? And you're going to try that. You'd like to play with that before you leave. Would be fun to play with that a bunch, but our time is up in the playroom for today. Yep, you just spin it just like that. Mm -hmm. There. His hand, like. Like that. Like that. Mm -hmm. So he can walk like that. He can walk like that. I know you'd like to play a lot, but it's time to go down to the wedding room where your mom is. You'd like to pound with that, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've pounded with that, and it's time to go, Kate, down to the waiting room where your mom is. Oh, don't forget, to oh, don't forget my picture there. You got the picture from me. Here's my picture. One picture for me. We almost forgot the pictures you painted. And these are my pictures you made just for me. There, you got that back, you got that off. We can take the pictures with us down to the waiting room where your mom is. Yep. Thanks. So in that you'll notice there was the warnings that he gave her and that even though she wanted to stay in play, he just stayed calm. He repeated his message and he backed away and moved out of the room with her. Those are the things that I think are important at the end of that. All right, Jackie. Okay, uh, so just to summarize on some of the things that we talked about today, uh, during the special playtime, you, you wanna make it enjoyable and convey that, that you're enjoying being with your child, using a warm, friendly, voice, conveying that. Uh, really important is accepting child's feelings, expressions, and faces just as they are. And I emphasized this earlier that, that the power of being able to communicate that to the child, that just accept them however they are and whatever they're doing within limits um, is powerful. And along with that, as we said, they're leading. So you're allowing what Ever happens in the session to happen that the child wants to have happen. So there's this sense of permission for the child to explore and to take the lead and to decide what to play with. Um, and that allows the child this freedom to feel that they can express a range of emotions or feelings or experiences that they're having once there's that sense of permissiveness conveyed. Watch for the feelings and reflect those back. So when, we, when we're talking about tracking and reflecting, it can be, it's, it's almost easier to reflect what they're doing and what the behavior is. It can be a bit trickier sometimes to catch those feelings, um, but if you can catch those feelings and reflect those back, um, that can be very powerful. So if, if a child's been working on a uh, with the blocks and it's been stressful and difficult and he finally gets it and he turns to you and he's got a big smile on his face because oh you're really proud of that you worked hard on that and really capturing that sense of pride that and happiness that he's conveying um, similar for sadness and other feelings as well respecting the child's ability to solve their own problems so not jumping in with advice um, or problem solving for the child this takes patience. It can be hard to do. I think our natural impulse as adults is to want to jump in and point out the very easy solution that's apparent to us. Um, as, and, but if you can squelch that impulse and, and allow the child to take 
her time to figure out what is what's going to be the solution that can be really important, as was mentioned earlier, in terms of developing that sense of, of pride, self-efficacy, and accomplishment, and self-esteem. Um, very important. Um, try not to rush, hurry your child. So sometimes a child might take like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just looking through all the markers or looking at the different toys and seem to be taking a long time, get going, um, or doing something. That's totally fine, whatever the time is. That's what it takes. And you'll notice in the video, as Heather mentioned, the end, even though the special playtime was over, um, Gary Landreth was calm. He wasn't rushing her. There wasn't this sense of we can leave now. It was still maintaining that calm, unhurried approach. And as Mariah and Heather have mentioned, only segments when they're needed. And that's for keeping people safe and for protecting property. Um, and really important, have fun. This is a time to just relax. It's not a time where you have to worry about teaching your child something or learn, helping them learn something or correcting them, as we said earlier. It's just a time to enjoy them. And they're in charge, so they take the lead and you're just following them. So we encourage you to, to have fun with it. Thank you. These are some resources that you can go to um, and look at. And we've also included, I think, um, I think it's the next slide B with some reminders around the categories of the toys, which I had forgotten to we had there um, as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we could talk about play forever, uh, but we recognize the time limitation and we're out of time over time. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to listen to us. It's been our pleasure. We had some, a few really, really good questions. And, and for those who are still available to stay with us, we encourage you to stay. I want to remind you also that we'll be putting the recording up on Saanich Neighborhood Place's YouTube page and our website. So um, not today, but hopefully by the end of the week, they'll be up there for you to, uh, to look through at your own pace. Um, so I'll read out uh, the questions. We have about seven questions. Um, so one question is, we have a punching bag type toy. Would that qualify as an aggression toy? I haven't come across the idea of aggression toys, but I can see how important it is for kids to express these emotions safely too. That would be a great toy to have as part of the aggression toys, for mm -hmm. sure. And sometimes that toy might even be used like as a mountain when you're doing play too. So that again is just allowing them to make it whatever they want to make it. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question, will kids enjoy the similar play each time or as they lead if we, uh, if we always are the followers, do they feel the contrast between real life and play time? As in real life, as parents, we give more instructions, will they feel that we are disengaged? That's what the be with attitudes are about. So it's if you're with your child, you're present, you're showing interest, you're reflecting their feelings and emotions, they won't feel like you're disengaged, but they will notice a difference for sure. And sometimes they'll even say, why are you talking to me so weird? And I think the idea is just kind of practice it until it becomes more comfortable and the kids will become more comfortable with it too. But really work with your be with attitudes, let them know they're special, they're important to you and you're with them. And a lot of that has to do with how your body's facing, your tone of voice, and reflecting the behaviors and the emotions that you're seeing in front of you. Anything else? Also, yeah, I think also for kids to help differentiate between special playtime and real time, real life, is if, if you have these select toys, so that's kind of where it helps a little bit to have that consistent time, if possible. And you introduce it as, Susan, this is our special playtime today. And here you can play in many different ways um, that can add it's time to leave our special play time so using those intro markers of this is our special play time and our special play time is over can help kids um, see that difference between during special play time when you know I get to be in charge the whole time which yes can be quite different from the different play outside of it as well too so that can help for kids to have that um, those markers and to differentiate that difference yeah, and you could also, if you have the ability to, and you might not, because you're using toys that are probably shared by multiple kids in the home, if you could, 
if there's a way to keep them so you only bring them out for the special play time that can also help with marking that that special time but don't take their favorite toy and put it in that box and only use it in special play time another question yes so um a couple questions about uh, playing social play time with older children, so I'll kind of bunch them together a little bit. So um, one of the questions, if you're doing special play time with older child, do you simply change the type of toys? That's one of the questions. Um, another question, doo -doo -doo, if your child is 10 or older, what can you do instead? And oh no, that was those are the two questions around, uh, yeah, older children. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of toys and alternatives. The be with attitudes are going to be the same. So the, you know, having that, having that set time, uh, that's just for them. You're following them, you're reflecting, you're imitating, like all the, all those attitudes can be the same. You're right. The toys are going to change depending on the child's development and age and maybe the activity. So for some kids, it might be, um, them cooking with you and them taking the lead on that, or it might be doing arts and crafts with them. Um, you know, sometimes like for the really older kind of kids when you can have be with attitudes in so many different ways, like even when they play video games, even though we wouldn't say usually you play video games within special playtime, but you can still um, be with them, right? Comment what they're doing. Oh, that was a really, you know, tough move, way to go, you know, all that you can incorporate it in those activities as well too. Um, but yes, the, the toys are going to change, but the be with attitudes are going to be the same. I don't know if you guys have to add. No, I, think, I think you've summed it up well. It's following their interests. Mm -hmm. In sports, it might be in something creative. It might be something else. But as they get older, it's really about continuing to follow their lead. It just might be outside of the house at that point. It could be bike riding. It could be, as you said, gaming. It could be maybe they're great painters whatever it is that they're interested in, it's just following their lead and really focusing that time again. And you wouldn't call it special play time, you might call it our special time together or something like that, whatever fits. Okay, thank you. So two more questions. Um, is there any advantage or disadvantage to doing special play time more than once a week as long as it's consistent? Oh, we've got keeners. Do one, <laughs> one of you guys wanna take that? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, usually we say once a week because that is attainable or it can be attained by most families. Most families are busy and we rather have it once a week consistent than let's say twice a week and then missing a week. And so I think that's why we, and I think the research just kind of also shows us that sort of once a week is, is good, is, is maybe enough. Um, Having said that, if let's say there's two parents and and one one you know, one parent does it on Mondays and the other parent does it on Thursdays, I don't see anything. I think that can only be beneficial. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But I, I would rather strive for consistency than like like too much and then not being able to do it just because life gets busy. Mm -hmm. One of the things we haven't said very clearly and. Um, is when we say parent, we really want to be exchanging that with caregivers. So that also could be a grandparent, whoever in their life is important, special, and consistent. Yeah. Um, so that would also be an okay thing, or foster parent, or whomever is involved on a consistent basis with the child. And one of the things we've noticed too is the parents that we've done this with, sometimes they'll slide in an extra one here and there, and it's because something really big has happened in the child's life, and that's okay too. So it's sort of having the consistent every week and then as needed, if something big comes up, sometimes the kids will come to you and say, can we have special playtime? And I would again, follow their lead if you have time and it's the, you know, it's the right place and all of those things. Final question. Uh, will kids be more interested in a safe and new environment to play with parents? And I believe this question came during the last video. Um, as uh, this clearly was not the child's home environment. I believe mm -hmm. the question came. Mm 
will the child, so just make sure I understand the question. So will the child um, be more interested to play if it's not at home? Is that? Yeah, the question is, it's, it's, will kids be more interested in a safe and new environment to play with parents for a special um, playtime? Hmm. I don't, mm, don't, I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> I would second your no. <laughs> okay. I think, I think it depends more on just the consistency, again, setting it up in a way that they're engaged, having sort of the materials that you can available. And you don't have to have a ton, you just have to have a little. And again, we'll go back to sort of the parent is the best toy, I think we said. And it's more about the time with you and that engagement with you. And the other stuff are just tools. You're the main part of this, and we really want to emphasize that as the parent or caregiver. So it'll be different than if they came and played with me for sure, but it's really important and actually I think more valuable that they play with you in a familiar environment sometimes um, with things that they know. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. The question. Great questions. Yeah, really good questions. Thank you everybody for those great questions. If there are no more, and I don't think there are, um, we can end the session here. As I said, it will be posted on Sandwich Neighbor Place YouTube and website by the end of the week. And um, feel free to email me through the Eventbrite where you would have registered um, or Facebook. You can message Sandwich Neighbor Place on Facebook and we have any questions that come up. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Heather and Jackie and Mariah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see you all soon. Sounds good. B, are we able to stay on when everybody leaves? Yes, I will stop the broadcast. Yeah, just a quick second.